The world was very different when Rose and I were growing up. We are in the process of trying to write our memoirs, and that has led us to go back and think and relive our youth. And we are struck enormously by how different the world is. We are far wealthier today than we were then, but we are less free and we are less secure. Economically, we've done enormously well. In terms of the kind of society we live in, we've done very, very badly. Let me suggest, let me uh, show the different, what's happened to the relative importance of these two markets. I graduated from high school in 1928, a long, long time ago. When I graduated from high school, total government spending in the United States at all levels, federal, state, and local, was a little over 10% of the national income, about 11, 12% of the national income. Two thirds of that was local. Federal government spending was about 3% of the national income. And that's roughly what it had been since the Constitution was adopted a century and a half earlier, except for periods of major war. Half of that went for the Army and Navy. Local government spending was something like seven, eight, nine, local, state and local, and half of that was going for schools and roads. Now, today, total government spending at all levels is 43% of the national income, and two-thirds of that is federal, one-third state and local. The federal portion is 30% of national income about, or 10 times as much as it was when I was graduated from high school. <laughs> And, the, the, and that statement, that, that figure, understates the fraction of the resources that is being absorbed by the political market. Because in addition to government spending, government mandates a great many expenditures on all of us, which government never used to do. From the simple thing of having anti requiring you to pay for anti-pollution devices on your automobiles, to the clean air bill, to the uh, aid for disability, you can go down the line. If you add in the costs imposed on the private economy, that essentially the private economy is an agent of the federal government. Everybody in this room was working for the federal government about a month ago, filling out income tax returns. Why shouldn't you have gotten paid for being tax collectors for the federal government? But that's a use of your resources. So I would say that at least 50% of the total resources of our nation, total productive resources, are now being organized through the political market. In that sense, in a very important sense, we are more than half socialist. <clears throat> so much for the input. What about the output? Consider the private market first. And there has been an absolutely tremendous increase in our living standards, almost entirely due to the private market. I have a, a gentleman whom I don't really know, but by the name of E.B. Lee, graduated from the Harvard class of 1934. And at the 55th reunion of Harvard in 1989, he read a little piece about, entitled, As We Were, and I want to read that part of it which deals with the physical conditions, because it brings it out better than I can any other way. And here's what he wrote. We were before frozen foods, computers, radars, credit cards, and ballpoint pens. For us, time sharing meant togetherness. A chip was a piece of wood. Hardware meant hammer and nails and software was what you slept in during the hot weather. <laughs> we were also before ice makers, dishwashers, clothes dryers, electric blankets, and disposable diapers. When we were in college, it was a privilege to go. Pizza, Cheerios, frozen orange juice, and instant coffee were unheard of. 
AIDS were active charity or breath mints. <laughs> In our day, grass was mowed, smoking was fashionable, pot was something you cooked in, and fast food was what you ate during Lent. <laughs> farmers, farmers and businessmen took risks without thought of going to the government for help. And I cannot resist quoting from a non-economic part of his poem. He went on to non-economic parts, but I, I just want to quote one sentence. We were probably the last generation to think a girl needed a husband to have a baby. We were young and gay. <laughs> Speaking for myself, I would say that radio was in its early stages. Television was a futuristic dream. Airplanes were all propeller driven. A trip to New York from where my family lived 20 miles away in New Jersey was a great event. And I never was west of the Delaware River until I went to graduate school at the age of 20. Truly a revolution has occurred in our material standard of living. And a revolution that has occurred almost entirely through the private economic market. Government's contribution was essential, but not costly. Its contribution, which it's not making nearly as well as it did in an earlier time, was to protect private property rights, to provide a mechanism for adjudicating disputes. Beyond that, you have to recognize that there were some spin-offs from wartime research, war research that private industry was able to use. But certainly the overwhelming bulk of what I've described as a revolution in our standard of life came entirely through the private market. Now in sharp contrast, look at what the output of results of the greatly exp expanded role of government has, has produced. Whereas the private market produced a higher standard of living, the expanded government market produced mainly problems. Again, the contrast is sharp, if I may make it that way, in our own personal experience. Both Rose and I came from families with very low incomes, incomes that by today's standards would be well below the poverty, so-called poverty line. But we both went to government schools. We both thought we got a good education. Families in our condition, in, in our, at our, families today who had an income corresponding to what we had then would, be, would likely be much less fortunate. Their children would have a much harder time getting a decent education. As children, we were able to walk to school and we weren't afraid of being mugged. And we can walk in the streets almost everywhere. An interesting contrast is that in the depths of the Depression, the 1930s, when the number of truly disadvantaged advantaged people, people in great trouble, was far greater than it was today, than it is today, there was nothing like the current concern over personal safety. And there were very few homeless beggars littering the streets. What you had on the streets were people trying to sell apples. There was a sense of self-reliance at that time, which is, if it hasn't disappeared, it's much less prevalent. In 1934, I was a graduate student at Columbia University, and we thought nothing of walking across Morningside Park down to Harlem and going to, the, uh, uh, going to the entertainment places in Harlem. There was no, uh, the subways were safe, they weren't, they weren't, there was no graffiti, there was no danger of being mugged, it was a different world. Moreover, you could even find an apartment to rent. <laughs> when we moved to New York, after we got married and moved to New York in 1938, to get an apartment, we looked in the uh, in the apartments available column of the newspapers, took a half a dozen that we wanted to look at, looked at them, rented one. People used to give up their apartments in the summer, in the spring, go away for the summer, and come back in the autumn to find a new apartment. It was called the moving season. <laughs> now, New York today, the, probably the best way to find an apartment is to keep track of the obituary columns. 
What's produced that difference? Why is the New York housing a disaster today? Why does the North Bronx look like, it's, uh, like parts of Bosnia that have been bombed? No question. It's not because of the private market, it's because of rent control. And it's because of government activity. Again, when we moved to Washington in 1941, it had a population of 700,000. The metropolitan area had a population of perhaps a million. Today, Washington, D.C. has a population of 600,000. And the metropolitan area, 4 million, almost all making a living out of spending other people's money. And are they spending it very carefully? Despite the current rhetoric, despite all the emphasis today on the economic problem, that's not our real problem. We are a very prosperous country. Our economic problems are rather minor at the moment. The economy is basically very strong, amazingly strong. It is really a miracle, really a tribute to the strength of what private markets and free enterprise can do, that with fewer than half the total resources of the country, our private enterprise system can produce the highest standard of living in the world, a standard of living that's the, enemy of, that's the envy of everybody around the world. Our real problems are not economic. Let me give you one example of why, even in this area, as I say, uh, I'm inclined to say our real problems are not economic, despite the best efforts of government to make them so. <laughs> I want to cite one figure. In 1946, government assumed the responsibility for producing full employment. We passed the Full Employment Act. In the years since then, average unemployment has averaged 5.7%. In the years 1929, when government didn't make any pretense of having anything to do with unemployment, unemployment averaged 4.6%. So. Our unemployment problem, too, is largely a government-created problem. But nonetheless, the economic problems are not the real problems. Our major problems are social. Deteriorating education, lawlessness and crime, homelessness, which is a misnomer. It's the littering of the streets with mental of people who are mentally ill, who are, who are beggars or loiterers. <laughs> Not lawyers, no. <laughs> I said loiterers. Too bad. Too bad. I may say that in 1933 or 4 at the depth of the Depression, you couldn't walk down a street and find somebody, as we do in San Francisco all the time, who was sitting there with a sign, please contribute so I can get a shot for my cat. <laughs> At any rate, <clears throat> the collapse of family values, the crisis in medical care, teenage pregnancies, every single one of these have all been either produced by <clears throat> or exacerbated by the well-intentioned efforts of government. I don't need to demonstrate that to the Cato audience. <clears throat> Charles Murray, who's in the office, uh, audience, his book, Losing Ground, is really uh, persuasive evidence of the extent to which this is a government responsibility, and with respect to most of the others. The so-called homelessness on the street, largely a result of the emptying of the mental institutions. Uh, by a philosophy of liberation and so on. 